ownership, the word ownership, is a funny concept. Think about it. Uh, it's, it's, that's the idea I want to plant in your mind today. Ownership is a funny concept. How do we determine ownership? It's an interesting thing. Is it a piece of paper? I was here first. Uh, I touched it. My spit was on it. You know what I mean? Like, there's all kinds of reasons that we say, I own that. My daughter struggle, struggles with the concept of ownership as it relates to French fries. Um, for example, we'll go to Chick-fil-A, and uh, we'll order, and I pay for all the food, okay? And it, Right? And, I, and she gets a large french fry. Now she eats, she's one of the, I love my daughter in so many different ways. I love my daughter. Savannah, if you're in here this morning, I love you. But you eat really slow. And so sometimes dad's done with his french fries. And I look over, I'm like, oh, there's some available french fries. So I reach over, I grab an available french fry from, granted, in front of her person. And I dip it in her ketchup. And I eat it. She goes, hey, those are my french fries. And I'm like, are they? Are they your french fries? You know what I mean? So ownership is a, it's a funny concept. Why do we just say, this is mine? This is mine, this is mine, that's yours. This is mine, this is mine, this is mine. Especially in families and we share homes and it's kind of like, what? Toothbrushes, I think we can agree, they have single owners, okay? Other things, it's a little bit more difficult. So I want you to hold that thought, okay? Hold the thought that ownership is a complicated concept. For the last several weeks, we've been working through this Bible teaching series called Good Work. And the idea is asking the question, how do I find purpose in my nine to five? And everyone has, whether you have like an occupation, like a job, like a vocation, we talked about that, or maybe it's a little more difficult for you to define what that is for you. Uh, Maybe you're self-employed or retired or a stay-at-home parent. You have a nine to five. Like you've got a thing that's taken up the majority of your time and we spend the best parts of our lives, the most of our energy on that thing. To the point where like a quarter uh, to a third, some of us, of our lives are dedicated to work. And the question we're asking is, where do we find purpose in that? Like, so we've been diving in. Work, it seems, is a necessity. We, we seem to have to do it. And there's a lot of things we've talked about that have been helpful. And if you missed some of that, I totally encourage you to go back on our podcast and listen to the others. But today we're going to tap into the bread and butter of work, okay? The meat of why my, most of us go to work and get up every morning. And I'm going to tell you what it is. And you already know what it is. It's because we need that paycheck, right? We need that money. It's like there are things that we need money for. Food costs Money, cars need gas, kids need braces, and they keep on outgrowing their shoes and clothes. Every time you get some new ones, you're like, man, if you could just stop having a growth spurt for about 10 minutes, that'd be awesome. And it's constant, it's constant. Our insurance needs to be paid, the internet and other entertainment things need to be paid for. It costs money, rent goes up every year, and the landlord, man, for some reason, she's pretty picky about getting that check every month. You know why? Because she got bills too. And that's part of her income. And so that whole thing, the paycheck thing, consumes us. And so we work. Yeah, we've got all these good spiritual reasons that we've talked about over the last several weeks, and they're good. But why do we work? To a large degree, it's because I'm trying to make that cheddar, right? I'm trying to get paid. I got things to take care of. And so, honestly, we would be doing this teaching series a huge disservice if we didn't talk about that paycheck component. You know, full, full disclosure here, out the gate, I want you to know this. We're a church that, I understand this. We want to be a church that will help tear down the walls that have kept people away from church and God. We've said this a lot of times. And it might be for you that a church talking about money has been one of those walls. You're like, bro, they talk, they talk about church. They talk about money. The second they talk about money, I'm out. I remember in a city that I used to live in, there was this, this, this church, and, and they were famous because they had his and hers parking places for the pastor and his wife's Hummer. You know, like, if you don't know what Hummer is, it's a very expensive vehicle. And they had prime parking, and I had people be like, I don't go to church because of them. I'm like, ah. So if you've been hurt by a church's mishandling of talking about money, that, that, that's not the way it should be, and I'm sorry. But this is a healthy thing. And also, go and let you know out the gate, this is not a sermon today about, like, let's give money to the church. Honestly, it's not at all. Because the truth is, you work, you get paid, and God has good thoughts about what you can do to honor him with your paycheck and how you think about it. So that's kind of out the gate to kind of break down some of those walls. Today our conversation is going to be about what goes on in our heart when it comes to our material things, particularly that paycheck. And I think that we can avoid some pitfalls that often come with a sick heart when it comes to our money. And so we spend so much time and energy and emotion and stress making a paycheck. Here's the question. What does God have to say about it? 
So to get there, as always, we want to look at the Bible. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and break it out. Feel free to drag your phone out and get, a, get on the Bible there. I highly recommend the Version app on any app store. It's a good Bible. We also have paper Bibles by the door there if you want to get a paper Bible. Uh, they're free. Take one home with you if you don't have a good Bible. We want to give away free Bibles every week if we can. Um, and so we're going to be looking at a lot of different places in the Bible this morning. And I, I want to start with a couple of foundational principles. And then we're going to look at three really good um, heart check things that we can all do, no matter how much money you make, how little money you make, that you can say, okay, am I, am I thinking right about my material possessions? And so first of all, we're going to just look, this is in the book of Psalms, chapter 24, it's right in the middle of your Bible. When I was a kid, I learned this trick. If you open your Bible up, almost directly in the middle, you're normally close to Psalm. So Psalm is, is a book of uh, teachings and songs and poems that the, the uh, Old Testament Israelite people used as teaching about God, and they would sing these songs, just like the songs that we sang this morning. And there's a verse in here uh, that I think actually can answer some quick questions about our paycheck. Let's look at Psalm, there's a chapter 24, sorry, 24 if you're still turning, and verse 1, this might be one you want to star or underline or highlight, because it's going to relate to a, literally everything in your life can relate to this verse, and you'll see why in just a second. Psalm 24, 1, it says this, the earth is the Lord's. And everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. I told you, it's going to, it literally affects every single part of your life. That is a broad statement. This is our foundational thought for the day. Everything belongs to God. Ownership is an interesting concept, isn't it? It's mine. Well, that's yours. Uh, Is it? It's God's. God wants to take care of our needs, and he does, but it's still all his. And even though we call it mine, you call it yours, it's all his. And so this concept is all over the Bible. I'm not just cherry-picking verses. You see it all over the place. One of my favorite verses about this concept is in James. So this is in the New Testament now. Flip all the way to the back of your Bible. Near the very end, the book of James was written by uh, a guy who was actually the half-brother of Jesus. He was a guy who was a skeptic, didn't even believe Jesus was son of God, Messiah, divine, until he saw him raised from the dead. And he was like, wow. I mean, if your brother did that, you would probably second guess it too, right? And so this is, this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, and he writes this as he teaches the early church there, James chapter 1, verse 17. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. And so the cool thing is, everything in the world belongs to God, but he rains it down on us as a gift. I mean, this is yours. You can use that. So first concept, everything belongs to God. And it's a really hard pill to swallow because this is what goes through my mind a lot of times. It's like, well, I set my alarm and, and I got up this morning and I drove my car and I put gas in it that I paid for and I drove to, you know, my job and I worked my 8, 10, 12 hours today and I put in my blood, sweat, and tears and I took the risk, I made the leap, I went to school, I did all this stuff and nobody's going to tell me what to do with my money. Nobody's going to tell me what to do with my fine. My, 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 uh, my time, not the government, not the church, not my wife, maybe not that last one, but other people, like, I'm not, no one's gonna tell me what to do, but God's like, mm, it's mine. And so it's really cool that you did all that stuff, but let me ask you something. Who gave you your time? Who gave you the ability to be here? Yeah, that's mine too. You got these skills and talents and abilities, you did good in school, awesome. Who allowed you to have those opportunities? Who gave you these talents and these skills? Now, you might be in a place right now in your own spiritual walk where you're just like, I'm still grasping whether or not God actually did do that for me. I'm just coming from a place where I totally believe that. I hope maybe you can come on that journey with me and and see it too. But everything is God's. But that's not all, okay? Second foundational principle of this. Everything is God's. Everything belongs to God. But God has made us his managers. That's a big principle. I used to work at a restaurant for about four years between um, high school and all into college. I worked at Andy's Cheeseburger and Cheesesteak. Anybody love Andy's? Don't talk to me about Highway 55, okay? It's not the same, all right? Don't even give me, if you're not from around here, you don't even get that. But if you are, you're like, he's right, he's right. <laughs> they changed since they changed. Um, but I worked there and I, w- I was in management a little bit. I wasn't the main manager ever of a store, but I did a lot of traveling managership and I would be like the cook manager or wait staff manager or like a shift manager. And here's the thing, it it blows my mind. Do you realize how routinely businesses are completely run by teenagers? Oh yeah, 
like especially restaurants, and it's crazy. So I'm 17 years old. I can't tell you how many times when I was 17 years old, like I'm completely in charge of a restaurant right now. Yeah, we trust you. Take it. Boss is gone, and you're sitting there with a 15-year-old, like you got your worker's permit? Okay, go uh, clean the bathrooms. No. Okay, well, if you don't want to, it's fine. Uh, and so what's crazy is I can tell you, I, not me, of course, but some of my friends who are, had some of these responsibilities, they did not manage the restaurant the way that the owner would have managed it, giving away free food, being rude, being slow on orders, being sloppy, being lazy. In fact, one of our shift managers, one day uh, we got to work and he was gone. We were like, where'd he go? We found out that the owner had discovered that he had been giving away food to the point that he'd given away like, I think something like close to five or $6,000 of free cheeseburgers to his friends. He's like, hey, come on, I got a discount for you. It's my come on in and get a cheeseburger discount. And he was gone. And when the manager figured that out, it was, she was just like, what is what is going on? And she let him go. And here's the thing. Management isn't easy because you get something that is not yours, but you're expected to treat it as if it is yours. And maybe you're a good person, and when you borrow something from someone, you take good care of it. But I think it's also true that sometimes when we don't own it, we're less likely to really treat it like we care. You know? Management's complicated because it's not yours. And, and there, there is no sympathy from an owner to a poor manager. Ask any NFL coach who has a losing season how when the owner comes down and is like, look, I gave you millions of dollars of professional athletes, the best training staff that money can buy, this amazing facility, and, and, and you've lost all 16 games? How did you manage that? You didn't. You're fired. Management is difficult because... Back to our idea, everything belongs to God, but he has given us the, the ability to manage it. Jesus teaches through this idea in Matthew chapter 25. If you want to flip over to Matthew 25, we're only going to read one little verse, but if you haven't ever read this whole story before, I encourage you to maybe this week, make a note of that. He's teaching a parable, and it's just kind of a teaching where he's kind of making an analogy between us and God, and this is basically the, the rundown of the parable in Matthew chapter 25. He gives, there's this, there's this uh, master, this, uh, this, this leader of a giant household, okay, who has servants. And the master of the household is going to go on a journey. And he calls three of his servants to him. He says, listen, I'm leaving, but I got some funds that I need you to take care of while I'm gone. So he goes to one of his servants and he gives him five bags of gold. Anybody interested in that deal? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty sweet. I didn't know that gold came in bags, but apparently it does. This guy gets five bags. There's another guy, another servant. He gives him two bags of gold. And then to uh, the last servant, he gave one bag of gold. And so then the man goes on his journey. The servant who had five bags of gold, he puts that money to work. He invested, I don't know, he starts a business, I don't know what it does with it exactly, but he puts that money to work, and over the course of the time while his, uh, his boss was gone, he earns five more bags of gold, doubles it. Same thing happens with the guy with two bags of gold. He gets the two bags of gold, he puts it to work, and when the guy gets back, he's got two more bags of gold, 100% return on their investment. So when the master returns, he sees this, and he goes to them, and this is what he says, Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things, so I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. This is a picture of managing well. You take what you're given put it to good use, and when the master sees it, he goes, wow, that's good, good job. Um, this is what Jesus' followers are called to do with the resources we're given. And today we're talking about that paycheck, which is eventually, like initially what I like named this sermon in my document, what am I calling this, that paycheck? But it's, it's what we do with the things that we earn, right? But it's also other things that we have as resources and our time. You know, one thing a lot of us have been put to manage, children. If you're a parent, that's something God gave you and was like, I need you to take care of this well. I need you to take care of it the way that I would take care of it. And so that's kind of how uh, good management looks, and that's kind of the goal of, of a Christ follower. And some of us were de are dealing with the five bags of gold situation. <laughs> We've got a lot that we're blessed with and we're thankful for. Some of us might be one bag of gold people, but the responsibility is the same. I'm giving you this. I want you to manage it well. That's the first two pe people in the parable. The third guy in the parable, he's got an interesting story. Because unlike the others, he doesn't put the money to work. In fact, he literally does nothing with it. He digs a hole in the ground. He puts the money in the ground and covers it up with the dirt. Um, it's kind of a weird thing to do. Maybe he just thought that was a good idea. But when the master got home, he saw that. You know what he says? 
you wicked and lazy servant. He was given a gift and he didn't do anything with it. And that is bad management. And so these parables are are metaphors of our relationship with God. And uh, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And there are tangible things that God has given each one of us to manage until we see him again. And it is a very real scenario for us. The question is, how do we faithfully manage the things we've been given? When it comes to our paycheck. Well, first of all, I think there's God's things that God wants us to do. I mean, we need to feed our families, right? You need to put food on the table for yourself and your loved ones. That's, that's a very good practical thing. We need to provide shelter and clothing. Uh, we need to take care of other people in need. That's a big deal. Maybe you've got investment funds and, and you're kind of like, like the guy in the story. Like, I want, I want to grow this. Like, this is an important thing. You know what? That is a godly principle as long as it's done in a godly manner. Maybe you've got retirement stuff saved up. That's great, good. Maybe you support good causes uh, like the missionaries that were here last week or Bear Foundation or you've decided to take on a foster child or these kind of things. We then do other things. Remember, every good and perfect gift come down from the Father uh, above. And so maybe you have entertainment in your life. Guess what? That's fine. That's not a sin. You can go out to the movies. That's totally cool. Maybe, maybe you had Netflix, and then you switched to Hulu, and then recently you got Disney+. Plus. Good for you. Maybe you got all three, because you can't decide, and you've got 7,000 hours a day to watch TV. That's awesome. But we got these things, and the entertainment is really good for us. But here's a question. How do you decide what to do and what not to do? What is the plan? What is the purpose? What are the lines that we can draw around things in our life and decide, I do that thing, but I don't do that thing? Like, and unless you intentionally kind of dig into God's word and and spend some time in good godly counsel, it would be really easy, I think all of us can attest to this, to simply get off course. If you've ever had a $20 bill and then you bought something kind of useless with it, just like a pack of gum, you ever notice that it just vanishes? Like I had a 20, but now I got like $2. What? What did I even buy? And I'm hungry now and shoot, I don't have any cash. Because if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a purpose for how you're managing this stuff, You can get off course so easily. And it's easy to mismanage the things we've been given. You might not even realize it at first. Like entertainment is fine, but then you might realize that trip to Disney that we took or that new car that I bought, ah, that's really way outside my budget. It's really way outside my means and I really didn't need that. And you know what that is? That's mismanagement. And we start to have stress about it and it adds up. And there's a lot of things that we could discuss in this vein. I'm not even going to go there because you know we all have our own thing. We're like, yep, I know what we're talking So you, you plug that into that spot, whatever it is for you. One of the most common struggles revolves around the concept of debt. Debt is a huge thing. It's a vice. And I, there are a lot of ways to go into debt. Some of them are calculated debt. You, you buy a house. I mean, you might not have $160,000 or $250,000 to buy the house, but you know that over the course of 15 to 30 years, you could afford that. That's a calculated risk. But then there's other things are just like swipe a card, swipe a card, new TV, new phone, new shoes, boom, boom. They're gone. It's not a calculated debt. And before you know it, it piles up. <laughs> One crazy mind-blowing thing that I look up every couple years, because I teach on this about once a year, and I constantly look up this statistic. According to the Federal Reserve's G19 report, whatever that is, That report, it says this, the average credit card debt per U.S. household right now, or back in June actually, was $8,398 per household. That's a lot of money, and that's the average. That means a lot of people are way over that, okay? June 2019, that's the statistic. If you add that, multiply that by the number of households that they survey, that is, listen to this number. This is how much credit card debt we have in America right now, $1.07 trillion dollars. Trillion dollars. I don't even know how to write that. I don't know how many zeros that is. I would, have to, I would literally have to think and count commas before I could figure that out. That is a lot of money. And this is just credit card debt. This isn't the calculated risk. This isn't other debt. I think it shows that we got a problem. And that's one of the mismanagement issues. And it's not a financial issue. It's a heart issue. Is because we haven't taken the time to step back and ask ourselves, what is the purpose behind what God's let me manage? So what I want to do with the time we got left is, is do a bit of a heart check and see if we can make some adjustments in our heart to make it tick a little bit better 
in line with the things that God wants us to do. So we're going to be in the book of 1 Timothy for the rest of our time. If you've got your Bible, flip over to 1 Timothy. We'll be in chapter 6. This is like a go-to chapter if you just want to kind of have that heart adjustment about money. And so take a look at it and read some more of it as you go. We're going to be starting in verse 6. And I think from this we can find at least three solid principles on how to adjust our heart as it comes to that paycheck. Okay? And the first one, before we read our verse, I'm going to give you the first one. The first one we'll see, this is 1 Timothy, starting chapter 6, verse 6. 1 Timothy 6, 6. The first heart principle is this. Learn contentment. Learn contentment. Our tendency is for more, 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 more money, more success, more hours, more houses, more cars, more vacations, more devices, more debt, which leads to more stress. But we want more, pile it on. And if it's never checked, if our desire for more, more, more is never checked, it will never end. It is a monster that will eat us alive. Why? Because contentment is a heart issue. It pumps through our very person. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 6 through 10 is packed with advice. And so we're going to start there and just look about contentment. First, it says this. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation. Listen to what it calls this, this concept of wanting to get rich, if that's our whole drive, if that's our purpose. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Those are strong words for the love of money, the love of money, not money itself, but this pursuit this lordship of money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from their faith and they've pierced themselves with many griefs. The love of money puts us in trouble. And contentment says, okay, well, this is contentment. This is the opposite of that. My needs are being met. And I can be thankful for that. Thursday, it's a pretty big holiday. I'm pumped about it because of food, but what's the holiday coming up Thursday? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And here's the ironic thing. That's the day nationally we've agreed. We're all going to be thankful this day. Thankful, thankful, thankful. Thankful is at the heart of, like, contentment. I'm so glad that I have what I need. But while you're watching the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and football and that weird dog show that's always on TV on Thanksgiving, um, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, what? What? Uh, and while you're, while you're doing that, while we're being, we're thankful, we're thankful today, what is every single commercial going to be shouting at you? Black Friday, 10% door busters, get in now, eight coupons, come on, 4 a.m. And you're just like, and you know, what the, you know what everything in the world is pointing at? On the day where we're supposed to be the most content, we are told, you need more. You don't have enough. You need at least four more pairs of shoes. And by the way, your children need this toy. It's going to be obsolete in six months, but they need it. Isn't that ironic? It's a heart condition. And if we're going to fight that, we've got to learn contentment. Contentment with godliness is great gain. If we keep reading uh, back up to verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. They've pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, Love, endurance, gentleness, and fight the good fight of faith. How are we going to find this contentment? How are we going to break down the monster that is greed and all this stuff? I'm going to call this second piece of advice this. Switch currency. Currency is money, okay? I think we need to switch our currency. Uh, and let me explain what I mean by that. So we're going we're we're to learn contentment. We're going to switch currency. I spent a summer in West Africa when I was in college in Ghana. I loved it. And one of the first things we did when we got there was we had to take our U.S. dollars and we had to exchange them for the Ghanaian currency. Um, and it was, what's funny is I think I took like two or three hundred dollars for the whole summer. It was a very low cost of living there. And so I didn't need a whole lot. And I wanted to be able to share with the families that I stayed with. So only like two or three hundred dollars. And they said, we're going to go to the exchange office. But here's what you need to do. You need to bring a book bag with you. Because to exchange that two or $300, it's going to take a book bag to carry the money you get out of there. I think the exchange rate right now is something like a dollar to five of their currency. So like one to five ratio. I think it was a little bit worse back then, like 2002. And so anyway, I go in there and, and, and I remember having three bills, three $100 bills. I handed them to the clerk and then they opened the safe and they just start taking out fistfuls of money and shoving it in my bag. And I'm like, 
dude, this is what it feels like to be Jay-Z. Like, that's what, I'm like, this is, I, I'm so excited. And I put the book back on, like, boom, and I'm ready to walk outside. Now, here's the thing. I felt rich. I felt like I needed a bodyguard. I had max 300 bucks in my book bag, okay? And this is what I realized. I had a book bag full of money, but it was worth way less than the three bills that I brought in. This is what happens when we get focused on materialism. When we think that something holds value because it's more, because our book bag is full, because our garages are full, because our cell phones are shiny. But really what we do is we trade these valuable things that God has given us, this option that we could have with him, and instead we trade it for something less valuable. In fact, Jesus says in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, he says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? King Solomon in the Old Testament says this, and by the way, King Solomon, when he was the king of Israel, was one of the richest people on the planet Earth. This guy had gold plated spoons, man. He just like threw them outside. I mean, this guy was rich, okay? I don't know if he actually did that. We don't have a record of him throwing spoons. But what I'm saying is this guy was rich, and this is what he says about wealth, Ecclesiastes 5.10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on? Book bag full of nothing. And guess what happens when you die? Don't matter what you think happens. It's not yours anymore. <laughs> and so we need to have a, an, a currency exchange, a switch of, a, a, of currency and say, I need to decide what really matters in my life. What's really valuable? God gives us money to provide for our needs. He lets us have some entertainment. But when we get these resources, you know what God really wants us to do with it? He wants us to build his kingdom. He wants to take care of other people. And he wants it to not invade our hearts so it starts to take the throne. But instead, he wants us to be able to focus on him. If you ever find yourself finding meaning and purpose in something that you can buy with money, can I please ask you to stop? There's never enough. But instead, ask yourself, can I begin to lean into what God's doing in this world and find my purpose in him? Guess what? He created it. He knows your soul. He knows your heart. And instead, this is what Paul tells Timothy. We read it a second ago, the second half of verse 11. Instead, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. He says, fight the good fight of faith. So we need to learn contentment. We need to switch our currency, have an exchange rate, or forget the exchange rate analogy. Just stop finding so much value in things that perish in this world, but find value in spiritual things, God things. Here's the third thing we find in this passage. I'm gonna go ahead and give it to you. And you know it's gotta be this. If you've ever missed this sentence, anytime we've ever talked about finances at our church family, it's this. Be generous. That is the only way to be with the resources we have. Anything beyond that is not honoring the heart of God. Be generous. God is a generous God. You know what he gives us first and foremost, generously? His grace and his love. He's like, for free. You don't exert, you don't deserve it. You did all these bad things, you've turned your back on me, but that's cool. That's fine, if you will turn back to me, I will give you forgiveness and grace, and I will love you despite your brokenness. And he gives us generously in the rich possessions that we have, and he gives us generously, it says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. It's a beautiful thing, and so in 1 Timothy, uh, we're still in 1 Timothy chapter six, now we're at verse 17. He says, so command those who are rich in this present world by the way, that's us, okay? We're just not even gonna have that debate because I don't know if you've looked around the world, but like Americans, even the poorest of us have some pretty good situations. But he says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share in this way they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. 
as we begin to be generous and we begin to pe- treat people in life the way that God treats people in life, the cool thing is it says we will store up treasures for us in heaven. Now, I, I, want, you to, I want you to don't think about this as like when I get to heaven, there's going to be five bags of gold. You know, that's, the, the riches in heaven is the ability to just know like I'm living in this sweet spot where God created me to be. Like it's working. And the closer you can get to that and the more you can live in that heart, the more you start to realize wow, this is so much more fulfilling. This is so much more gratifying. This is so much more purpose in my life. Because when we are seeking the heart of God, which is a heart of generosity, we begin, to, we begin to kind of act like him, think like him, do the things that would honor him. And something that can begin to reverse the course of greed and materialism and focusing on the wrong currency, something that can begin to shift that for you is a heart of generosity. Let me tell you this thing. So often people say, I can't wait till one day when I can be generous. I'm gonna tell you a secret. One day will never come. Because there's never gonna be enough. There's not gonna be like a point where you're like, okay, now I have an extra billion dollars. Now I'm gonna give that away. That's one reason why we see that in the Old Testament, God talks about percentage-based giving. Because you know what? 1% for a person with one bag and 1% with a person with five bags, still 1%, is scalable. That idea says no matter where you are, I can be generous. And so here's my encouragement for you. Start today. And there's a lot of ways to be generous. You can be generous through hospitality. You can be generous with your time. You can be, but I want specifically, we're talking about good work. We're talking about what can I do with the things God's blessed me with. And I want to encourage you, be generous with your money. Find ways that you can share. Paul says that when we're generous, we lay up treasures for ourselves for the coming age. Generosity is an investment in eternity. Learn contentment heart condition. Switch the currency. Find value in things that really matter and be generous. Those are the heart check things this morning. Something really cool happened last week at our church. If you were here, you you were part of it. If you missed it, I'm so sorry you missed it. Uh, We had missionaries here from Southeast Asia working with Pioneer Bible Translators. Wasn't it awesome to have them with us and just hear their stories and be like, wow, they're just doing it. And so we made this thing. We've got a great group of faithful leaders that are in charge of our money as a church. We have offerings come in, and one of our goals is to be, have high levels of integrity and make sure we're investing in a kingdom-based thing, God's kingdom-based things. And, but one thing that these, these, there's four individuals, great integrity, uh, great managers of money, and so much wisdom, and they pray about things. And one thing they said a couple months ago when they found out that uh, these missionaries are going to be here was like, we want to bless them with a gift. And we think the best way we can bless them with a gift, and we do this a couple times a year, was just to give away our entire offering that week. And we, and man, what, we don't want to go down like pinching pennies ever. And we're like, let's just be generous. And so we use this phrase. We say, we want to be hilariously generous. We want to be generous to the point where it's like, you <laughs> did what? And I got to tell you guys, these guys outdid themselves. God outdid himself last week. Because we said to these missionaries, we want to give away our whole offering. And we talked about it. And I, mean, I just want to share with you the gift that you guys gave to these, ministry, these missionaries. God, God made this possible. We will be sending them a check for over $6,000. Yeah. I want to tell you something. That is not the normal offering that comes in in this building. (laughs) Small caveat, there there were some people outside of our church that contributed to that. But the majority of that amount came from this room. You know what that teaches me? It teaches me that we live in a generous community. And if you're in a place where you're like, I have a hard time doing that, I have a hard time letting go, I want you to know something. You're among good people are already doing that and we know that God's going to take care of our church's needs we're a new church we just turned six years old in September they're still from month to month we're like are we going to break even this month they're going a whole little bit we got supporting churches that still like help send us funds to take care of things but we know like I'm going to give it away and make sure we got the heart of God then to hold on to it be like oh my precious because that isn't going to get us anywhere I want to encourage us church family be a church that's generous the currency that we work with as a church family is generosity and God's blessing. Not one of fear, not one of debt, not one of materialism, but one of open-handed generosity. And that makes the good work that we do worth doing. Let's pray together.